everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host of the chats that I produce with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. Today, I'm sitting down with Ms. Sherry Jubilee, who, by her own uh, description here, and I'm going to read it, this is what I've been sent, is an onion hard to pin down and a lifestyle educator and a professional performance artist. Would you tell us a bit about these, please? Well, I kind of think the world is, uh, is a balance of things. And I've learned that I have a lot of unique talents. Some of them were opened up by being introduced to the leather lifestyle and BDSM and kink uh, related activities. You know, I never knew I could wear ballet boots and things, but I had tap dancing lessons as a kid. Who knew? Um, so I use my uh, talents and abilities in multiple dimensions like I do burlesque and I use circus sideshow I use my art of shibari and suspension into doing circus aerials for performance and uh, use some of my mind over matter submissive techniques learning uh, that I was an extreme masochist um, after a lifetime of not exactly knowing what it was that I had some issues with you know I, I turned into a, a nice uh, way to round out some of these oddball things that made me an outlier in most of society so are, are you hired by events or something to perform for them or how, how does that happen for you Abs absolutely I uh, I've been I, I get hired through um, charities I've done both uh, USO of Illinois um, mm -hmm. as well as charities within the leather organizations you know things for the leather archives I used to do their uh, their mobile uh, mobile uh, presentations, as well as um, you know, do charitable fundraising at events, like having people staple money to me for mm -hmm. you know leather title holders fund, that kind of thing. So it really depends on whether or not it's something that's mainstream performances. I I I've done Geek Nomicon, Comic Cons, uh, traveled all over the place doing nightclubs and just having a grand old time, I guess. But I probably wouldn't have done so much of that if I hadn't learned more about what my kinks were coming into the community. Let's go back to step one, though, and uh, let's find out who a little bit about you. Okay. Um, please tell us a bit about where you're from, a little about your early years, because it was a bit tumultuous for you. Well, without delving straight into it, turned into living with a father who is an alcoholic and abusive, meaning that I, mm -hmm. I, I can live through trial by ordeal and, tur and turn it into something that's erotic in, in, in my adulthood. I, I grew up normally as a military brat. You know, we traveled to Japan when I was a kid um, and I didn't come back until I was in kindergarten. And, you know, I was teaching the Japanese uh, tea ceremony in my kimono when I was six years old to my first grade class. Oh, and that, wow. that was like cool stuff. I was a tomboy. I climbed trees when my dad sort of was forced to semi-retire due to an incident. Um, you know, we went back to my mom's side of the world in Maryland and I learned, you know, about the historic sites. I was close to PBS television. So I appeared on Mr. Wizard and some other things as a kid and had some really good memories, but uh, uh, my dad was also not settled well in a civilian world. And so he expected a house full of women to jump like his, uh, you know, ensigns did on the aircraft carrier when he was an electronics chief. So it didn't end up well. And uh, I left the home and was put into foster care during my teenage years. So I kind of lived on the street and used my talents and survival skills and nine lives as a as a unicorn rainbow butterfly kitten to kind of make my way and survive a lot of things and turn it into a craft of storytelling and um, recycling, you know, the past into something new and better and an empowering, uh, empowering kind of thing, taking the abuse and the words that were said and turning it into a means of growing stronger and getting a better sense of self and being able to turn it into a service so that other people can learn from it. So it sounds like you uh, recaptured that power for yourself to be able to then reuse. Absolutely. I mean, I, I consider the community um, generally speaking a safe place. I mean, we, we go out of our way to try to make it a safe place to explore things. And we took elements like the uh, the food control and the and and 
cook chicken livers uh, so that they could be stuffed down my throat in the middle of a, of a, a traumatic scene about uh, trying to weigh me on a scale and objectifying me um, in the middle of the dungeon at that scene. And, and it was very cathartic. I mean, I wouldn't say I was 100% healed, but it helped me focus on, you know, abuse and trauma in a different way because I created the parameters. Explain a bit more about cathartic, though. How is that cathartic for you? Well, I mean, when you're dealing with mental health issues, and I, I do believe that um, you can get some form of therapeutic release from sexuality based uh, activities. You know, I was spanked by my kindergarten teacher because I was in a private school and I accidentally made fun of her name, but now I really get off on spanking. You know, you utilize some of the things that you had as trauma in a childhood, um, uh, to sort of turn it into something that is more meaningful to you and, and puts you in a better mindset instead of focusing on the negativity of the traumatic experience, you turn it into something that's empowering. When my father called me a cunt, now I say I'm a cunt because I'm a, a switch. You know, I like dominating and, and, and I know the power of words. I like to pick apart somebody's brain with some humiliation and some mind fucks only so that they can expose like an inner part of themselves and heal. You know, um, I, I have sort of a Japanese aesthetic of highlighting things that are difficult to deal with. And I feel like it's very cathartic, um, you know, doing things like laying on a bed of nails. And, and one of the best things I've learned about being in the community, whether I'm performing a skit in a fantasy show or being a keynote speaker or a judge is that all of my scars in leather, or when I recycle my leather into a fashionable boa or something that may be superficial on the outside, it's, it's a second skin. It's a second chance. Um, you know, so it's both physically, mentally, sensually cathartic. And to me, that's kind of like a spirit of the divine, you know, you get to go to a subspace or you become primal and, whether or not you admit it, you can be a top if you're a slave, or you can be a slave if you're a top, depending on your circumstances and situations and how you want to unpack um, your safety net and your scene. Do you identify particularly as a, as a dominant, a sub, or where do you fit in, in any of that nomenclature? Well, I mean, the community would count me as a switch. In reality, I was a submissive throughout most of my life, having difficulty with male and female authority figures and felt that being a submissive or a slave when I first found the real community and not just a, a kind of like a nightclub atmosphere, um, you know, I wanted to be in control. I thought that was the top, but I learned that you can control through the bottom as well as the top. I started taking lessons in classes and said, well, gee, all the subs are and the, and the slaves are having the most fun being hit by floggers and having their pussy punched till they squirt. Fuck this shit. I'm going to like do this myself and sort of figure out, you know, what feeds my soul. But then I also learned later on how giving, um, you know, sensory uh, and tactile information through varying endorphin inducing intensities, because I don't like to use the word pain. It's, it's all sensory apparatus. And um, so I, I felt like learning um, from the bottom up, like, you know, is the way to go. Um, but I, I dominate, I tend to dominate a lot because I'm a chatty Cathy and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a bossy lady about my own expressions of being able to know what I want, even if I don't know what I want. Well, how were you exposed to the community? How did that come up for you? Um, my official debut was Kinky College in 2006 or 2005, I believe. And, and then I kind of got into with a core group of people, went to a bunch of munches and started doing some presentations and traveling because of my knowledge and my prior teaching and training skills in other um, areas of life and society, so. But how did Kinky College come up for you? And, and also maybe for the viewing audience, would you please explain what it is? I, I don't know that everyone's familiar with it. 
Okay, well, you know, this was my first uh, lifestyle event. I've been to nightclubs and bondage a go go, like at the exit, um, to kind of get in with the goth and kink crowd that I sort of grew up with, but didn't know how to get real BDSM or community uh, information. And so I found uh, Kinky College, which is a lifestyle event filled with classes and it has play parties in the evenings. It's a, over a weekend usually sells out of a hotel. Um, and boy, do I have some great stories about the Purple Hotel. I'm sure everybody who's been to Kinky College at one point or another have heard some of those stories. Here, here in Chicago, yes. Here in Chicago. But I, I mean, I met Joanne Gaddy there, you know, so and, and some other places. She taught me how to fist. So I'm ever grateful for that in one of her classes. And um, I started going to more of these lifestyle events and learning and sort of training myself and sharing my personal experiences in both uh, classroom and performance art that included my kinks. And so Kinky College was a good structural foundation to find the event. But how did you even learn about Kinky College? I shouldn't think that that's something a lot of people would have known. Well, thank goodness I didn't have to do it old school, like go to a bookstore and put an index card after a newspaper uh you know, add in the personals or something. I mean, at least I had the internet, you know, after the, the people at the, at the nightclub told me about the, the, the types of events that were in the Chicago area, I was able nice. to look it up. And uh -huh. then that led me into what other events, because everybody advertised other lifestyle events. And I started being a, a, a devotee. So. Well, a little earlier uh, you alluded in various forms to BDSM being somewhat therapeutic. How is it therapeutic? How do you see it? Well, I kind of see it. I, I've taken courses on sacred uh, spirituality, you know, or, and, and, and sexual um, identity. So, I mean, along with the psychologists and therapy and mental health um, professionals giving me cognitive behavioral therapy. I've utilized a lot of the, the techniques to help me be a better uh, person in the community. I mean, I can help somebody have a little instruction book so that you can smack somebody's face and not hurt them or not harm them, but, you know, give them the right amount of hurt that they want, that they can come, then that's a great thing. Or you can explore, um, you know, different areas in role play that you couldn't uh, necessarily if you're just coming home every day to normal average variety sexuality. And so it's therapeutic to be able to take off layers for the outside world and be more yourself or be closer to some of those things that do make you, even if they're kind of a little flawed or broken in other people's eyes, you have to find a way to creatively express those. And BDSM does that, you know, it allows you release in both uh, a spiritual sense, a sensory sense, touch, uh, hearing, uh, visual, or the absence thereof, you know, sensory deprivation. It, it helps you focus on, different aspects of yourself. And I feel that that can be very therapeutic. Um, and we give ourselves permission or we have a good structure with us, a, a power dynamic. I found a way to express it in a, what I feel is a healthy way um, by, you know, learning about boundaries and consent and, and where I can take it on at least my personal level and my personal journey to a healing and a growing perspective. What, what you're depicting, I feel, is something similar I've heard from other people in that in practicing BDSM, you can uh, constructively experience sensations in a positive way. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, even when you're piercing somebody and giving them a Prince Albert, you know, you're not doing that without their consent because you still kind of set back and reassess your boundaries and are able to find uh, some framework to be able to move forward. Tell us about your title holding. The title holding for me um, started off as like a, a way to use my modeling and fetish modeling background and kink background as a means to sort of focus into 
um, something that would be a more positive experience and, and a learning experience, understanding leather, power dynamics, BDSM more fully, and also a sex title, you know, to go out and go play and not feel constrained, um, you know, by getting out of a bad MS or DS relationship. So uh, I won the title of Miss Illinois Leather Pride 2012. I moved to the regional, um, which was Great Lakes Leather um, in Indianapolis. And I, I won the regional and then followed up um, the, the leather path of International Miss Leather. Um, had a great time, had a lot of interesting um, experiences throughout the competition phase. Um, I got to know Mama's family a little bit better. I'm Mama's uh, cherry pirate. And Sir Bear um, Abbott, uh, Mama's 7-Eleven, was my original uh, title daddy. And wow. um, he was awesome, but at the same time, he felt a little out of his league as a producer. And I ended up Daddy Ron being his partner, being my my daddy more because... I guess being a, a gay male leather master, he had no clue what to do with the bouncy, passionate, enthusiastic femdom who, you know, is is like one of those anime characters or ha I literally have been called a Muppet mistress because of my dom style and my creative antics um, in the dungeon, you know, both as a top and a bottom. So, um, but he illuminated me to like, you know, some of the, the things about leather that I could never experience, like the back room at Touche, there's places I can't go. And, and you know, in some respects that also eluded me and, and let me open up a few scars and wounds about feeling left out. And, you know, so, um, but it, it makes you learn a lot. So, you know, I've gotten to know people like Joanne, like Majori, um, I was a fetish model, so I know Rubber Doll and, and Lokai. I was on kink.com, and not many people can swing upside down by their ankles with their arms tied behind their back and a dildo going on in them and, and, and lick a pussy till my partner squirts. It's fun. I don't regret that. I do regret that my sexuality and my lifestyle has taken, like, my heart. Because I do wear my heart on my sleeve. It's, it's really something that because of my finding myself, my passions, and my creativity within my sexuality, you know, you asked me about my identity. Well, BDSM took away my son because, you know, le legally, I'm still a pervert and I'm a porn star. And it's unfortunate that my ex-husband, my first ex-husband, used that against me in a court of law, even though he tried to join GD2, you know, um, and it's awkward, but, you know, one of these days, I'll have the opportunity to help my son learn about things. You know, we did cosplay together, you know, going to comic cons and things. And, and I hear through the grapevine that he's now going to places like Frolicon and, and, you know, uh, he's taken our, lifestyle you know to heart for himself which is awesome you know we haven't yet uh been able to you know get back together because the lifestyle was used to put a wedge between me and my son by my ex-husband yeah. you know i had to answer questions about my collar <clears throat> in a legal deposition you know why what does that have to do with how i raise my son you know, and, and I'm not the only person who's had problems like this. You know, when you're faced in a domestic violence situation, um, people can use anything and will use anything against you, you know. Um, and, and legally, um, you know, what we do sometimes is definitely abuse. So how can you say you enjoy being spanked and having your pussy punched, but you don't want to be smacked in the face in anger by your ex-husband because, you know, you just worked a 36 hour shift and he's lost his job, you know, in front of your four year old child. It's like uh, people have different perceptions. And so it's hard. Having been through that particular hardship, that that I'm just going to say absolute misery of having your son taken from you. What advice can you offer someone who may be watching this video who's facing something similar? Well, first of all, make sure that you have a good lawyer. Um, and I'm not kidding. Um, and, and use um, all of the resources here in the community. Um, you know, we have 
therapists who are aware, um, you know, here in Chicago, we have the center for Halstead and I used Kala, um, to help me, which is a, a, is a legal organization that I found, um, through swap S W O P, which is a sex workers union. Um, I'm sorry, what is Kala though? Please explain oh, to the audience. Um, Kala, uh, I can't remember the exact name. It's just C A L A, but they're a legal organization that helps you if you are a sex worker or, or someone in an alternative lifestyle, LGBTQ without funding, uh, you know, I was a single mom when I was trying to raise my son and had all of this stuff happen to me. You need people who understand you or get you and get what you're going through to help you through this. And there are resources in the community that you can use. So the BDSM and the leather community were very helpful um, because I went to a regular lawyer and they literally asked me that question. You know, well, you were you put a restraining order against your first husband, but you have pictures up on the web about you being tied up at Shibari Khan. So it, it, it's, you need to be aware of what you put out on the internet. You, you know, I am one of the legal reasons for why we don't shoot photography at general lifestyles events anymore, because it was used against me. And, you know, why people wear wristbands and, and do all of that. This is the need for it um, because it is a lot about perception. And whether you're a title holder or you're a teacher and you're trying to maintain your sexuality and your sexual identity, which is at least now not considered a psychosis, right. um, right. you know, you still have to be careful since the Internet and the, you know, your pictures and stuff could be anywhere. Um, I'm a fetish model and even going back to some bad exes, I, I let them know that some of their pictures I found on the internet where they weren't supposed to be in, they didn't have permission. So, you know, there's 2257 laws for a reason, you know, to make sure that people are safe and of age. Um, so we just have to be more aware of the things legally that we need um, so that when you are put into a position of vulnerability, you can legally not have to worry as much. I'd, I'd like to take a quick step back though, because you've brought up information there that I can't help but think might be beneficial to other people. Sure. Will you please talk a little bit more. I, you called it, um, was it a SWOP? Is that right? Yes, it's a sex workers um, union. They work with uh, people who are professional uh, sex workers. And because I do BDSM professionally as a dame, um, which I got into when I was actually someone's slave um, because I needed an income and uh, the recession hit and I could use my sexuality to bring in an income. So I did phone sex work and I still do. I, I love telling stories and um, but there's a little bit of, of uh, dichotomy on that, even in the community, because I charge for my time for certain services as a professional dame. And I've been asked to like remove that information from some of my bios when I've been a presenter because uh, uh, the community doesn't mind selling toys and dungeon time and space to dames. But, you know, you go to an event as a presenter or as a player or an event goer, but up in your hotel room, you're taking somebody and charging them money. So, you know, there's there's six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. We're trying to be open to things. But if you march to a slightly different drummer, sometimes, you know, you get you, you get some perceptions that may or may not be misguided. But coming back to the title holding a little bit, mm -hmm. what advice do you have for people looking to enter the title holding circuit? Make sure that you understand why you're going in the first place. You know, it's not just a pageant. And also recognize that you really need to make both a time and financial commitment. The basic questions are how much support do you have? Because my entire, my entire regional title holding uh, travel fund for about $1,200 went to pay for my hotel at the, at the International. And the rest of it, I had to come up with myself. And, um, you know, as a regional, I traveled to like 25 different events in the course of a year. Um, and, you know, it got expensive, even when I, you know, joined with other fellow leather brothers and sisters. And um, I'm not shy about helping out, but, you know, 
as a presenter for a number of years, if you don't have a solid financial basis and good support structure at home, it can make or break your relationships too. So I feel like if I had had a little more preparation for both understanding what it was I wanted to get out of being a title holder, you know, I knew it was part of my journey to, to bring me closer to my own identity, but I didn't know how the title holding for me was a good opportunity to perform public service. You know, I'm used to being behind the scenes and supporting other people and, you know, stitching a leather corset for them and tying them into it as a stage manager, as opposed to, you know, the person on the platform, even though I'm a performer, you know, so it allowed me to find um, a connection between my, my social self and my performance art self uh, with my leather and BDSM community and find my brothers and sisters. So that was good. But you used an interesting phrase uh, mm -hmm. when we were preparing for this chat, and that was sacred sexuality. Tell us, what is that? Well, I don't know anybody else who could disagree with me that orgasms are not divine. Would, would you say that orgasms are divine? I know I would. Come on. I guess it would depend. On the, on the situation. Well, I mean, I suppose any orgasm to me is divine, but I mean, you know, sacred sexuality is really about um, bringing in the energy um, to the moment of your sexuality, you know, until I unlocked some of these things like, you know, the oral fixations and, and by oral, I also mean aural, all the, the senses. It's, I have some health issues that give me some nervous disorders, some tics and some, some sensitivity things. And, and it's like, I realize that there's a sacredness because I was born this way. So, you know, Lady Gaga's song about being born this way, or if you're a transgendered person or somebody who's not sure about who you are, it, it's kind of like there's a certain sacredness in, in finding your sexuality and finding out that it's not grounded in any one thing you yeah. know it's not yeah. it, 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 it's it's fluid it's yeah. um it's a part of the universe you know I, I i wouldn't say that there's necessarily a bdsm bible but i i i cannot say that you know there is 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 no divine content when it comes to sex and sexuality because it's a part of who you are it's part of your innate nature and your makeup from the atomic level. There is just a moment that is so sacred and so divine, um, you know, that even an orgasm can be something that isn't necessarily physical. Like it, it's emotional, it's um, sensory, it's uh, mental, you know, and I could be having one right now, you don't know. <laughs> Wow. So, so that's kind of what I mean. It's like recognizing that everything has an energy and that if you put that, um, that sense of, of, of spirituality and wonder and divine oneness with your own nature, that you, you learn a lot about yourself and, and about, you know, how to deal with control issues and daddy issues and pain and, you know, whatever else comes across because, you know, it's too wondrous not to be aware of it. Well, where do you see the BDSM kink overall community evolving in the next few years? Currently, I think it's kind of a little bit of an amoeba stage. Um, you know, uh, 10 years ago, it was a little secular and we had like rope artists in one area and kinksters in one area and gay, lesbian, uh, queer, kind of pansexual, all in a different area. And there were some Venn diagrams where they kind of overlapped. But now I feel kind of like with um, BDSM and alternative lifestyles in general being more open to the mainstream, I feel like we have both um, a grand opportunity um, to practice what we preach is probably the best way to put it because sometimes we say that we don't care what kind of drummer you march to but occasionally there's a few drum beats we don't want to have in our drum circle um you know and i i find that that might be a negative but that's changeable all of that's changeable and with currently the increased attention to um speech while i'm i'm not in generally fond of political correctness you know political correctness speech for 
for political correctness sake. I, I believe in saying a truth and speaking your own authentic truth. But sometimes that gets me into trouble because I'm kind of like a devil's advocate. And, and that may, may make me a pariah in some circles of the community. Still does. Please, but Please give me an example of what you mean by that. Well, you know, recently a lot of people, there's been politics on both sides. And so you learn like, you know, if you're if you're on one end of the spectrum of politics versus the other, that if you say something on social media, you know, somebody who's been um, uh, essential in bringing about things like a mama for mama's family, you know, um, she was recently ostracized and, and, and criticized for saying some things on social media. And people are forgetting that, hey, we all make mistakes. Sure. You know, um, and and we all have to you can't point out to some other person, you know, what their mistake is without opening up a whole nother can of worms. And you have to kind of look at yourself first before you open up that can of worms. And so, yeah. um, you know, there's been a lot of people who, you know, I, I'm against cancel culture because I think we learn from history. And if we cancel one part of history out, we can't learn from it. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Um, I'm not saying that the things we are learning or representing from that culture are good or right or anything, but uh, I feel like the BDSM community um, has hidden a lot of things, like maybe some homophobism, you know, from the heterosexual community or, um, uh, or even, God forbid, I point this out from the gay community having some heterosexual phobia, you know, it's, 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 there's a little on both sides. And I think we're a little more open now to being able to talk about it because we had some sudden shocks and people kind of got all over themselves and, you know, created drama. And now that things have settled down, we can maybe approach things in a better way and a more meaningful way. What's the biggest misconception about you? Because I use humor and have some ADHD, obsessive compulsive components to my personality and quirks that people don't understand. I think I'm misperceived or misconstrued when I'm really trying to have an intent of communicating knowledge or passion. And they just think some of my stories are stories. And to me, I mean, sure, they're stories. And I'm, I'm currently rewriting a new story and a new opportunity. I'm, I'm going to try to, in the next couple of years, build a sanctuary for people like me who've had issues with domestic violence or, or their personality and sexuality and uh, need a place to go but can't bring their pets or, you know, are afraid they can't bring their kids or something. I, I want to eventually work on something that helps give back to the public. But I need to be able to do that in a constructive way. And I don't think people take me seriously. I'd say that's true of a lot of us in the community. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in, in conclusion, you, you just alluded a few minutes ago to some future plans mm -hmm. of building some kind of a sanctuary for people who require that kind of support in the community. Please tell us what your plans are with that. Well, I've already started on a business model. Um, I kind of feel like it's almost has to be a not for profit. I mean, we have like the uh, the Carter Johnson Library for, you know, the the LGBT um, uh, 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 periodicals and things. And we have the Leather Archives Museum. Um, and there are good quality counseling centers, you know, like the Center on Halstead has all sorts of resources and things for, for LGBT youth. Howard Brown, I've used them for years. That's where I get my therapy from now. But um, I want to provide a sanctuary, a safe space where you use traditional arts and crafts and disciplines uh, like the leather work or cooking um, or hospitality services like a bed and breakfast, you know, to help people heal. But I want people to be able to use performance arts, uh, taking care of animals, you know, it, I literally had the choice of killing my cat or moving into a safe space. I mean, my cat had medical issues and was 17 years old, but it took me three months to decide to put him down and move into a safe space. Once I got a divorce, I, no one should ever have to do that. I mean, my cat could have lived another couple of years, but you know, it, it's like making those kinds of choices. Uh, I don't want people to have to worry about. I, like I said, five minutes before I got on site, 
um, of a, of a BDSM event, I had to give up custody of my son and make a determination legally, um, because of my lifestyle. I want people to feel safe. I want people to know that they have a place to go where they can start over. And if they stay there for years, that's fabulous, but we want to be able to teach you crafts. So that we can sell your gifts in the gift shop, you know, that kind of thing and help put that back in towards, um, you know, we'll take a modest commission like the Leather Archives does with like, you know, all the museum gift shops and things like that, you know, to help support the the, the process. Yeah. But, you know, house rules, um, a board of certified board, you know, just like the museums and things for a not for profit. That's my goal in the next three to five years so that there is a place for people to go when they're hit by a pandemic like we've been and lose their jobs, you know, and don't have some place except the streets to go out, especially, you know, um, young people who end up having to be on the street like me at 15 and pretty much selling myself, you know, in order to survive. And um, it, it's, it's a good thing that I can take um, this abuse and the childhood trauma you know, that I've survived uh, and put it into good works. But I do think that the transformational properties that the community in both uh, kink and leather um, have allowed me to explore has given me that strength to be able to say, this is my goal and I'm going to work on it, you know, come hell or high water so I can help others. Cherry Jubilee, thank you for an amazing interview for joining Inside Leather History at Fireside Chat. I appreciate it. I really appreciated the opportunity. Say hello to all of the archivists and all the people in the community. It's been a pleasure and uh, pain. (laughs) No, I'm teasing. It's been a pleasure.